Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, all right, program number four, and uh, then we can be heading out of here. All right, again, we always like to emphasize to our television audience that we're just a simple Bible study. I'm not trying to build an empire. I, and I said a few programs back, I have no intentions of building a college or anything like that. We just want to teach people how to study the Word of God on your own. And uh, I think we're making some headway. I really do. It's not I, but the Lord is uh, masterminding the whole thing. Again, we always want to thank you for your financial help. We never ask for it, but the Lord always provides. And uh, again, we thank you for your letters, and we appreciate the fact that you keep them short. Many times people will say, well, I'm trying to keep it short because that's the way you like it. Well, it's just a time factor. If we're going to keep loyal and read all our mail, we can't spend time reading four or five page letters. We'd never get anywhere. So we appreciate your cooperation. Okay, let's just continue on where we left off in our last program, how that Jesus sent the twelve to the nation of Israel under the covenant promises. And when Israel finally rejected everything concerning those covenant promises, God raised up the Apostle Paul, designating him as the Apostle of Gentiles and in a complete opposite role of the Twelve. Now, of course, the Twelve were so steeped in Judaism and uh, even the term of proselytizing, some Gentiles, but you know, I always take away any emphasis on proselytes because of what the Lord said Himself concerning proselytes. He says to the Pharisees, you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, but when he is made, he is three times more the child of hell than you are. And what was that tell you? Proselytes were not any better off than the unsaved or lost Jew. So I don't put much on proselytes. But this man is not sent out to proselyte the Gentiles. He's sent out to preach them the gospel and to see them totally saved on the merits of the cross. Now, Peter, James, and John, of course, haven't quite accepted that. And I guess in order to clarify, before we go back to Galatians, where we ended in our last program, let's just stop at Acts chapter 15. Many of you know what it says, but many of you may not have. Acts 15, because this is the parallel with Galatians 2. This is Luke's account of the Jerusalem Council, as Paul's account is in Galatians 2. But Acts makes it more clear what the problem really was. So let's look at it a minute before we go back to Galatians. Acts chapter 15, <clears throat> we'll start at verse 1. Acts 15 Verse 1, Now certain men came down from Judea, which is Jerusalem, and they taught the brethren, that is, Paul's Gentile converts, we have to keep the language straight here, they taught Paul's Gentile converts, and they said, Except or unless you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. I want to remember that the Jerusalem church is ruled by the Twelve. And so these emissaries from Jerusalem could not have done what they were doing without at least the Twelve's permission. I'm not going to lay the blame on them that they commanded them to do this, but they permitted it. All right, now read on. Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto what group of men? The apostles. See, I'm not reading anything in here that isn't here. The apostles were the key players. And like I said in the last program, if you want to get something done, go to the top. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas are going to do. They're going to confront the twelve in Jerusalem over this matter of their emissaries coming in behind Paul and saying, you can't be saved by Paul's gospel alone. You have to practice circumcision and keep the law. Sound familiar? Well, maybe not the same items, but 
it's still, oh, you can't be saved by faith alone. In fact, one of the speakers who I suppose was in direct opposition to what I had said over in Greece said, James says that you cannot be saved by faith alone. It's works and faith. Well, you know, it's pretty hard for me to sit still when I hear stuff like that. But anyway, that's what we're up against. But it's always been this way. Way back here at the beginning of Paul's ministry, they are already telling his converts, Paul's gospel alone isn't enough. You have to practice circumcision and keep the law. Now you say, well, that's just in one verse. All right, read on. Verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, that is, the Antioch church, up there in Syria. Being brought on their way by the Antioch church, I'm putting that in only for clarity, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, that's all the way down through northern Israel, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. See, that's Paul's ministry. And of course, it caused great joy to the brethren. Now when they were come to Jerusalem, the seat of all their problems, when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church, the Jerusalem church. Now we've got to keep all these churches separate. The Antioch church is Paul's Gentile church, a body of Christ church, saved by grace through faith in Paul's gospel plus nothing. But they're going up to meet the twelve who are the head of the Jerusalem church, which is a congregation of Jews who are still keeping the law, they're still practicing temple worship, but they've embraced Jesus as the Messiah. That's the difference. Okay. Now then, when they were received of the Jerusalem church and of the apostles and the elders, they, Paul and Barnabas, declared all things that God had done with them among the Gentiles. See? Now verse 5. But even with all of Paul's and Barnabas' excited report of what God was doing among the Gentiles, but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees. Now, you remember what Pharisees were. They were legalist, religious Jews. And so some of them had been saved by believing that Jesus was the Christ and became members of the Jerusalem church, but they still didn't lose their legalism. So these Pharisees who believed said that it was needful to circumcise them. Now keep track of who the pronouns are referring to. Who are the them? Paul's converts. They had to be circumcised and they had to be commanded to keep what? The law of Moses. Now goodness sakes, what does that entail? Dietary law. Saturday Sabbath, the 10% tithe, or the 1 out of 10 tithe. The tithe wasn't 10%, it was 1 out of 10. Big difference. But that was all part of the law. Occasional temple worship, feast days, the new moons. Now, why am I mentioning all this? Keep your hand in Acts. Come back with me to Colossians. Now, this isn't to confuse. I hope it's to clarify. What a difference. Now, this is what Paul teaches the Gentiles in Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. And this is what they're up against. They wanted to cancel these things that Paul writes and put them all back under the Jewish law. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, 15, 16, and 17. We'll look at all of them. Verse 14. Speaking of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, you all know what ordinances are. They're rules and regulations. Now, the cross blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, I've got to be careful. What does it mean to be against them? Well, all those rules and regulations were contrary to God's grace Believing lifestyle. It was just contrary to it. Okay, the cross canceled them out. And they took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
So all these Jewish rules and regulations that were just a heavy thumb of oppression upon the Jewish people, they were crucified at the cross so far as the believer is concerned. All right, now then verse 15. Again, in reference to his death, burial, and resurrection, having spoiled or defeated principalities and powers, he, Christ, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, in his work of the cross, he just made victorious over all of these things that were in opposition. Now then, verse 16, here's where it comes. Let no man, therefore, judge you or condemn you in food or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon. Now, you've got to know your Old Testament and Judaism in particular. What set Judaism on their schedule? The new moon. See, the Jews would have somebody sitting on the highest point in the area to look for the first sliver of a new moon. And then that would declare a particular part of their, of their religious calendar. I think the Muslim world does the same thing. They're always looking for that first sign of the new moon. All right, now Paul is throwing all of that out. So we'll read it again. Let no man therefore judge or condemn you in food or in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon, the beginning of a particular religious schedule, or of the what? Sabbath days. Now, I just shared that with somebody the other day. They're always writing or asking, did the Catholic Church change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday? No, Catholic Church didn't do it. Paul's Gospel did it. And the early church met on the first day of the week, Resurrection Day, not on the seventh day. And so he was all crucified with the cross. Now this is what I want pe people to see. As plain as English can make it, we are no longer confined to these things of Judaism. They were all nailed to his cross. But verse 17 says, there was a day when they were valid because it was part of the Old Testament picture of what was coming. So they were what? A shadow. A shadow of things to come, but the body, the body of Christ, is of Christ. Okay, now then, I hope that clarifies what we're talking about at the Jerusalem Council. Paul says we're not associated with any of these things of Judaism. We're under a whole new ball game, and it's as separated as anything can be. But see, most of Christendom keeps mixing them up mixing them up, and the world is in confusion. All right, back to Acts, chapter 15. Now let's read verse 5 to pick up the flow. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed they were members of the Jerusalem church. And these Pharisees said it was needful to circumcise them, Paul's converts, and to command them to keep the law of Moses, which I just covered in Colossians. And the apostles, see, I don't want to leave the 12 out of this because this is hard for people to believe that the 12 apostles would be in such opposition to Paul's ministry. Flagrant. Oh, maybe not up front, but they knew what these people were doing. That wasn't all done in a corner. You know, I had a young lady who came out of a, a religious system several years ago, and she instantly became, I guess, one of my most avid students on her own, and she came up with this tremendous thought, and I hadn't even thought it before, but it was valid. She said, Les, didn't the twelve come awful close to the anathema of Galatians 1, 6 through 9? I'd never thought of it before. Yeah, they came close. They, they didn't go all the way, I'm sure. They're going to be in glory. You know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> come back to Galatians again, because this is interesting. This is interesting. Even though they weren't doing it directly, they were involved or Paul wouldn't have wanted to meet with them. But I'm sure they stopped short of it, don't worry. But there's a lot of others that haven't. 
Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I quote these verses constantly to people, and especially to pastors and Bible teachers. Be careful, because the moment you add something to Paul's gospel, you're under the anathema of God. And this is what she was questioning. Did the, Paul, did the 12 get close to this? Yeah, I think they were close, but they didn't get trapped in it. All right, here we go. Galatians 1, verse 6, where Paul writes to his Galatian believers now under this same set of circumstances that we're dealing in Acts, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. It's not something totally different, but there be some that trouble you these false teachers now that we're dealing with, there be some that trouble you and would pervert or pollute or corrupt the what? The gospel of Christ. Now, how do you pollute or corrupt something? You add something to it that doesn't belong there. I usually use the illustration scripturally of watering wine. It was just an easy way to produce more without any extra cost, and you could sell it for double but it was a corrupt product. Well, that's what they were doing with the gospel. They were polluting it. They were adding something to it that didn't belong. Okay? Verse 7. It's not another, but there some be that trouble you and would pervert or pollute the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed lost, condemned. Anathema is the word in the Greek. That's what's waiting for people who pollute Paul's gospel. Now, this is frightening. I make no apology for it. This is frightening. But that's what the word declares, and I have to declare it. All right, then he repeats it for emphasis. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, that if any, now the word man is italicized, it was added by the translators, but if any man or woman or anybody preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, that is from the Apostle Paul in this particular case, let him be accursed. That's strong language. That is strong language. And people just glibly gloss over it as if to say, whoa, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. Yes, it does. There's another verse in Scripture that is just as adamant. You might as well go look at it. Revelation, the next to last book in our Bible, if I'm not mistaken. Second to the last. <laughs> Revelation, chapter 22. Revelation 22. And this is just as frightening because you can see how many people are guilty. Verse 19. Got it, honey? Okay. Revelation 22, verse 19. Don't ever forget that this is in your Bible. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Strong language? Boy, you bet it is. Now, I'm a firm believer in the security of the true believer. Now, you know I teach it constantly. Paul says there is nothing that can separate us from the life of Christ, neither death nor life nor power, principalities, nor things in heaven nor things in earth. Nothing can separate us from love except evidently this, because this is speaking of people whose names are in the book of life and they'll be taken out. And I'm not the judge. God is but the Word declares it. Well, Paul says the same thing in Galatians. And I think this applies to preachers and teachers who are saved, but they blatantly add to the gospel and they come under the anathema of God. 
Are they still under the security believer? I don't know. But I would be awfully prone to think so. And consequently, you don't know how I sweat over staying true to the scriptures without adding to or subtracting from because I'm just as aware as anybody that this is anathema when you pollute or pervert the Word of God. All right, in the few minutes we have left, come back to Acts chapter 15 because this is what we have to see so clearly in our mind that here is one of these rightly dividing points. Jesus told the twelve, go not to a Gentile. To this apostle, he says, you go to the Gentile. And in order to not have it mixed, he kept Paul from having anything to do with the twelve until he had to meet with them to settle a problem. Not to share their theology, but to settle a problem. Big difference. Okay, verse 7. So when there had been much disputing, arguing, yes, they argued over this. And the twelve keep saying, Paul, you can't give these people this kind of a gospel. You have to demand circumcision and keeping the law. And Paul comes back and says, no way will I give in. All right, so after all, who knows, half a day or more, Finally, Peter rose up. Now, if language means anything, I think Peter was kind of out of the whole thing. I think he was just on the sidelines listening to all the hubbub. And finally, God activates him and says, Peter, don't you remember what happened over at the house of Cornelius? Don't you remember seeing Gentiles saved without circumcision, without law-keeping? Don't you remember that, Peter? And so Peter wakes up, and he rises up, or he stands up, and he said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago. Now here is a point I like to make to just show how clearly the Scripture reminds us that Peter never went beyond the house of Cornelius to a Gentile. He went right back to Jerusalem and picked up where he left off, got condemned for doing what he did, but he never made another move to go to the Gentile world, not a one. But 12 years later, now this is why I maintain that the whole Cornelius event was to come to Paul's defense. Oh yes, God was interested in those Roman centurion and his soldiers, but the primary reason was to get Peter ready for this day at the Jerusalem Council, right here. Peter comes to his senses, and he says, now wait a minute, wait a minute. A long time ago, 12 years, that's a long time in anybody's thinking. 12 years ago, God made choice among us, that is among the Jews, the 12 in particular, that the Gentiles by my mouth, the house of Cornelius, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, we haven't got time to go back, but if you remember the account of Peter preaching the house of Cornelius, compared to how he preached to Israel in Acts chapter 2, the process was repent, be baptized, have the remission of sins, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the process in that order. But in the house of Cornelius, it was reversed. While he's yet preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on those believing Romans. And then Peter says, what hinders us from baptism? Completely reversed. Why? Because now we're introducing the Gentile to a whole new system of salvation. Not through repentance and baptism and so forth, but by believing, because that's what Peter recognizes here. They heard the gospel. Now, it wasn't Paul's gospel yet. We've got to clarify that. That hadn't been revealed yet, but that God can save them any way he wants to. And in this case, they believed Peter's gospel that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. And when they believed it, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they were designated in Peter's sight as believers. Okay, all to come to Paul's defense. Wait a minute. I recognize that when I was in the house of Cornelius, 
They didn't do all the things that Judaism demanded. We didn't circumcise Cornelius and his household. They didn't agree to come under the Judaism law. So now he says, God's doing something different. Logic tells me that. All right, our time is just about gone. Verse 8, And God, who knoweth the hearts, you know, a lot of times I get questions, phone calls and letters. And you know what my favorite answer a lot of times is? Let God answer that. I can't. That's God's prerogative. He's the sovereign one. He is once in a while going to do things that maybe we can't figure out. He's sovereign. And Peter is saying the same thing. Who am I to argue with how God is operating? He is seeing fit to save Gentiles by Paul's gospel alone without law-keeping and circumcision. All right, now let's read on in the minute we have left. And so, verse 8, And God who knoweth the hearts, see, what does that mean? You and I cannot look at somebody and determine whether or not they're truly saved. We cannot, because we can't look on the heart, whatever you call heart. It's that invisible part of us, but God can and so Peter is using that as whatever you want to call it, a cop-out or an excuse or whatever. He said, look, I can't look on the heart, but God does. All right? And he bear them witness, that is, his Roman soldiers in the house of Cornelius. He bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did in us. Well, see, it took that to convince Peter that God was doing something totally contrary to what he had always been told. He would save Gentiles. Now, you see, it's hard for us to recognize the Jewish mentality concerning Gentiles. They just couldn't accept the fact that the God of Abraham would forgive and save those pagan, immoral Gentiles. And they were. If you know anything about ancient history, they had no morality. They were worse than animals many times. I was reading, while I was recovering from my hip surgery, I was reading history again. Went back to Alexander the Great. Constantly sacrificing animals after animals to his pagan gods and goddesses. And then when he was ready to go into battle, <laughs> he would just multiply it ten times over, see? And that's what the Apostle Paul was constantly up against. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call one 800 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.